You're listening to Innovators, the podcast from Harris Search Associates, where we speak with global leaders in education, research, engineering, and the health sciences, and ask them to share lessons learned as they continue to advance the frontiers of innovation and discovery. Today's podcast will be led by Rick Skinner, Senior Consultant. The title of this podcast was stolen shamelessly from the Boston Children's Hospital home website because it expressed so well what our guest and his colleagues have done recently. But the plagiarism is also prompted by the remarks of previous guests in our recent series on pediatric research. Then we heard from Mark Batshaw and Tina Ching of the possibility of major breakthroughs in the treatment of children. And sure enough, announcements were made that they change profoundly what's possible in children's health. We have the good fortune to be able to engage with Dr. Carlos Estrada Jr. from Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School and learn of work he and colleagues have been involved in, the outcome of which was just now announced that confirms a significant advance in biomedical science and in material science more generally. And we'll learn about that discovery from Dr. Estrada. But before we begin that discussion, allow me to share a brief biography of Dr. Estrada. Carlos Estrada is urologist in chief and co-director of the following at Boston Children's Hospital, the Spinal Bifida and Spinal Cord Condition Center, Eurodynamics and Neurology Program, and the Center for Gender Surgery. He is Associate Professor of Surgery at Harvard Medical School. He earned his undergraduate degree from College of the Holy Cross and the medical degree from Wright State University Boonshaw School of Medicine. He completed an internship and two residencies at Rush University Medical Center, then accepted a fellowship at Boston Children's Hospital, from which he then accepted an appointment to the faculty there. He earned an MBA from MIT. He focused his research on tissue engineering and urogenic bladder dysfunction. Welcome to Innovators. Thank you uh, so much. Would you mind taking a few minutes to describe the work you and your colleagues have been engaged in for some time now on, on tissue research, um, and particularly the rationale for pursuing it, uh, and as well as the significance for the treatment of children's health for children? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, the, the initial rationale was that as a surgeon interested in reconstruction, we're often faced with the challenge of not having enough or you know, sufficient or appropriate tissues with which to work in the operating room. And that forces us in many different contexts to use tissues that don't belong in a certain system. For example, we have long incorporated bowel intestines, so small intestine, large intestine into the bladder. We borrow tissue from inside the mouth to bring to the urethra. Um, surgical colleagues interpose intestines into the esophagus when there isn't enough esophagus. So all these things allow patients to get by, but they are of course imperfect. Those structures don't belong in those places. And so we just do our best. Mm -hmm. And as a reconstructive surgeon, not just me, but many of us have long sought a better solution. You know, how can we help these patients have tissues that are more faithful to their native tissues? And that is the subject of tissue engineering. And so I grew up here at, at Boston Children's Hospital. I trained here, um, was under the mentorship of a giant, uh, Dr. Alan Reddick. Uh, who was very supportive of tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. Mm -hmm. And when I was a fellow, Dr. Tony Atala was here, who's world famous tissue engineering. He now he's chairman of urology at Wake Forest and runs the Wake Forest um, Center for Regenerative Medicine. It's a very, very large, prominent tissue engineering initiative. So when Dr. Atala was here, and I was a fellow just observing this, they were using a certain biomaterial that was mixed with patients' own cells. So they would take biopsies of patients' bladders, grow those cells up, put those onto the scaffold, mm -hmm. put those into patients. And so they did several of these operations, in fact, seven, and published a very prominent paper in The Lancet back in the early 2000s. 
And that was absolutely groundbreaking. It was unbelievable. And what a triumph to be able to do this. And some of those patients did very well, but like any operation, not all of them did perfectly well. And being part of that early work and observing, I and others have asked, you know, are there other opportunities? And one opportunity that has informed how we have done things, uh, how I have done things since I started here on faculty was, can we find a biomaterial that can work without cells? Because getting that biopsy of the bladder, growing up those cells, putting those onto the scaffold, waiting for those to grow up and then bringing those back can work, but it introduces a lot of potential difficulty and complexity. And so can we find a biomaterial that can coax the body into regenerating itself? And in comes my colleague, Josh Mani, PhD, who came uh, to me as a postdoc scientist. And he didn't last long as a postdoc. He was so incredibly ambitious and successful. He became an instructor extremely quickly uh, and, then, and then got promoted through the Harvard Medical School system. And he and I were partners in this uh, from the beginning. Um, as the surgeon doing these bladder reconstructions in patients with spina bifida and having seen some of the challenges around the prior technology, the question was, is there something that we can maybe think about that could obviate the need for cells. Josh had come from Tufts University in David Kaplan's laboratory, who is one of the world giants in silk biomaterials. And when Josh first came to me and said, hey, what about silk? I said, well, that's not gonna work, Josh. You know, silk is very inflammatory and, and it's not dissolvable. And we know that, at least surgeons think that because suture, silk sutures are permanent sutures. Exactly. And they're very old school and we don't often use them uh, because they're very inflammatory and they're permanent. Yes. And so um, he said, no, no, that's before you remove this special glue protein called Saracen. If you remove that Saracen protein, it renders the silk inert. Uh, the body doesn't reject it. There's very little inflammation. And so let's give it a try. So over the ensuing few years, we, we gave different formulations of the silk biomaterial um, a try, and we tried it in different contexts. Mm -hmm. We tried it in small animals we, with primary cells, even with some stem cells. Amazingly, uh, a few experiments that we did early on in rodents in which we compared our silk biomaterial plus cells compared to just the silk and thinking that the silk alone was going to be not nearly as good yeah. just as good. And so all of a sudden we said, wow, okay, well, that's an unusual, uh, unexpected finding. You know, why would that be? And so over the years, that early silk, which was gel spun at the beginning, that became a, what our invention finally was. And that is this bilayer, um, which means that the one layer that is on the outside is completely watertight and it looks mm -hmm. like a sheet. So it's a, mm -hmm. it's a solid sheet of silk tissue, of silk material rather. The inner layer is about maybe a centimeter or so thick, a centimeter and a half, and it looks just like a sponge. And that is stuck to or annealed to the watertight layer. And there you have your biomaterial, mm -hmm. looks like a sponge. And so that became what we created in response to the need for when you're doing surgery on these patients and you're trying to reconstruct their bladder or their esophagus or their urethra, you don't want the contents of those structures leaking out early on or ever really, uh, but certainly not early on during the healing process. You want it to be watertight. So that's why we made it that way. And okay. so over the years, then we scaled up through small animal without disease, small animal with diseases that we made surgically, large animal non-diseased, and finally large animal disease models, which are very difficult to do and very expensive and time consuming, but we did it because you have to do it. So robust, rigorous preclinical models to be able to inform translation. And so in all of those contexts, we kept seeing the same thing, whether it was disease or non-disease, small, large, we saw robust, um, unexpected, but, but very welcome tissue regeneration, where the tissue that grew into the silk biomaterial scaffold 
that we placed into the defect in said organ regenerated incredibly well. And that includes esophagus, urethra, and bladder. So pretty dramatic. And it speaks to the power, I think, of silk and the inertness of silk and how it does not cause a rigorous, robust inflammatory response like maybe some other biomaterials might. It really is very gentle, I guess, to the immune system and the body takes it. And we've done some work into why that might be. Josh in, in particular has done a lot of work lately on why that might be. And uh, it just seems to drive the inflammatory response, the immune response toward a regenerative sort of path. And uh, very, very impressive. So we can thank Silk. We can thank David Kaplan. We can thank getting rid of Saracen. Um, we can thank, you know, the, um, the recognition that we need a watertight structure. And, you know, sometimes the serendipitous discoveries and, and it all kind of comes together. So, um, so that, that has been, that was the rationale. And that has been the rationale all along and kind of our path. And it's meant, therefore, that in dealing with the, ch the, the problems of a spinal bifida child, you are able, in effect, to go in and reconstruct and without a serious threat of, re of rejection. And uh, you don't have infection, very likely. Had work in silk been done before that gave some sense of why that might be the case? So a little bit, um, the, there have been, so there are some silk products in use in humans and, you know, Dr. Kaplan at Tufts really is one mm -hmm. of the, again, not, not just a giant, but a, a true pioneer mm -hmm. and his laboratory has spun off a few companies that have been successful and, um, but, but not in this exact space, not in these hollow organs that we've targeted, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. as a, as a urological surgeon. Um, but the ability of silk to be a successful product in a human body had been done. And, and so at least it made us, it gave us justification and good rationale for testing this in the first place, you know, when we were considering this as a potential biomaterial. And the significance of it, it's fairly obvious. I mean, this ability to reconstruct the organs that are either absent or absent, uh, means that a child has what sort of chance of living a more or less comfortable life? Yeah, so, um, well, that's, that's pretty significant. And so if you, have, if you have a child that has a really hostile bladder, as we call mm -hmm. them, from mm -hmm. spina bifida or a spinal cord injury, most patients these days anyway, we manage very proactively, medical management, and most of the patients can avoid a major reconstructive operation. Um, that does leave, though, a fair number still requiring this major operative intervention called an augmentation cystoplasty, mm -hmm. and that's making the bladder bigger by incorporating a patch of intestine. That operation can be life-saving in a lot of ways because at the end of the day, we do all of this to protect kidney function because that hostile bladder mm -hmm. that is defined as high-pressure you know, holding urine really high pressure that backs yes. up into the kidneys causes uh, potential kidney infections mm -hmm. that damages kidneys. And that is the fast track to dialysis. And so in the bad old days of pediatric urology, before we knew better, before we knew how to manage these patients, the vast majority, if they lived to early adulthood, would have renal failure. Always. Yep. And that was the standard. And so now that's the exception, thank God. But for patients that need an augmentation cystoplasty, the bowel option is, is really still the only viable true one, the one that everybody does internationally. Mm -hmm. And while that can be a kidney and therefore lifesaver, it comes with a whole bunch of complications and complications that are long-term, short-term, and that are not trivial. And so now you have a patient that has a piece of intestine incorporated into their bladder, that intestine makes a ton of mucus because it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. So now these patients have to put a catheter in their bladder, irrigate catheter. it every single day. It forms stones. It can form infections, lead to infections. It can cause metabolic abnormalities. So that bowel absorbs urine in a way that the bladder, of course, never would because that's its job. And the child, 
And the child, the child is in effect at risk constantly at their point. Exactly. And so it, it's a big league operation with unfortunately big league risks, the last of which is the most recently recognized risk, and we're talking the last decade or so, of mm -hmm. cancer forming in the long term. And so there have been a handful of patients, more than a handful of patients now, that 20 plus years after their augmentation cystoplasty are showing up with terrible uh, cancer in that, in that patch of intestine. Mm -hmm. And so our alarms are going off all over the place approaching these operations even more reluctantly than before. Yes. But sometimes you're painted into a corner. You don't really have other options. And so if we had this biomaterial that you could literally take off the shelf, again, okay, this gets back to our rationale, open up the package, open the child's bladder, sew this patch into the bladder, so and that's it. It's a huge victory. I have to ask this question. Over the last few years, we've encountered I would say more than several instances in, in a variety of fields, including veterinary science and prosthetics and the like, where the search for material uh, for tissue that has the kind of qualities you're talking about, that's sort of the holy grail uh, because it means so much uh, both for constructor and reconstructor sort of activities. Your work seems to open up a whole range of applications, it seems to me, that obviously it's important for urological and spina bifida, but it seems to me it would have enormous applicability in a variety of others. Is that too much to expect? It's not. And in fact, and there's so many big ticket items, you know, that this could potentially be applicable to like blood vessels. I mean, the engineering of blood vessels is something that so many groups are after. Uh, Dr. Kaplan is, has an active, very active program in, in, in blood vessel tissue engineering. It's a huge need, vascular surgery. I mean, people get grafts all the time that um, clot off and have all kinds of issues. And so imagine, if, yes, imagine if you could have a tissue engineered uh, blood vessel that you can sew in heart, you know, heart tissue. Imagine, I mean, all these things have a lot of similarities. Heart tissue is more complicated than the others, mm -hmm. but esophagus, urethra, bladder, uterus, um, blood vessels, they're all very similar at the end of the day in terms of their ultra structure, mm -hmm. um, smooth muscle cells, a smooth muscle compartment, and then a, a lining compartment, the mucosa. And so heart's a little bit more complicated, but, um, you can imagine uh, silk biomaterials forming the scaffold for, you know, heart tissue regeneration. And so, and that isn't even the, you know, the other, and that's just using what I would think is our, our bilayer, you know, leveraging oh. the benefits of having this watertight, but oh, it's silk, it's, silk itself is, I mean, you can have silk gels, you can have silk fibers, you can have, you can cast silk in so many different ways. It's unbelievable. It's endless. And, so it's and plasticity really opens it up to an even broader spectrum of applications. It, it does. It does. You really start with this silk solution. So fibrin is the protein. So fibrin solution, and you can do with it all kinds of very interesting stuff. Um, and that, I, of course, I lean on our material science experts like a Josh Mounty, like a David Kaplan, but it is extraordinary what can be made from uh, the raw material. And these are cocoons. I mean, I have it on my desk here. It's a silk. It's literally a cocoon from Asia that comes and these, these silkworm farms for textile industry, we get the same, there is medical grade as well, um, but uh, that are available, but we just crack open. Just the, available. It's available. So crack, crack open the thing. That's it. Boil it down. <laughs> you, you, when, when they made the announcement of, of your applications and, and uh, talked about what a breakthrough it was, one of the things that came out of it was the very real importance it, for its coming about due to collaboration. My assumption is that when we talk about collaboration, we're going beyond specializations. We may be going on to disciplines. We may be going to into a variety of areas. <clears throat> in some cases, it's moving from one profession, medicine, into, into engineering and the like. Uh, who was it that made that collaboration possible in your case? Because quite candidly, um, 
in our work, we, we encounter silos where affecting a collaboration, bringing about some sort of uh, collaborative activity is, is, a, is a significant challenge. What made it happen in this case in your eyes? Yeah, I, I think it was, um, I, I couldn't agree more, you know, and we are not strangers to silos either, um, <laughs> of course. And so I, I think most organizations are not. Uh, but we have such an incredibly re rich ecosystem here, uh, not just at Boston Children's Hospital, but the Harvard Medical School community. I mean, this Longwood area is just ridiculously rich in resources and in incredible people that are incredibly generous with their time and with their collaborative spirit. And so I think that, you know, we have leaned on people internally and externally. You know, and so for, for example, when we are trying to figure out why said biomaterial is effective and we want to interrogate the immune system, mm -hmm. we're not immunologists, we're not cell biologists. Um, we have folks in our department with that expertise, folks at Boston Children's Hospital in the Harvard ecosystem at Tufts University with um, that expertise. We collaborated very closely with David Kaplan's group. And, you know, he is an unbelievable, uh, he's in, in the engineering school. They have instrumentation that we just don't have and we wouldn't be able to purchase. I mean, maybe someday, but it's very expensive uh, and it's very high tech. And we, at least on a weekly basis, would go over to, to David's lab, bring our biomaterial with us and collaborate with his group openly and willingly to put our biomaterials on their instruments to test all kinds of physical properties. Is this what we want? Is this what we need? Let's formulate it in a different way. It's not stretchable enough. It's too stiff, et cetera, et cetera. And so that was an incredibly um, important collaboration for us. And that's with Josh Mani being a, being a material scientist himself. Mm -hmm. We still have to lean on others because we can't, have everything that we need. We can't have all the equipment. We can't have all the expertise. And so- So you could be driven by need, but but I'm still, Boston is an unusual place, I, I acknowledge. And that ecosystem is quite distinctive. But there are other places where we don't find that even with the, the proximity of talent, the rich talent pool and run, is there some culture that's built up and does someone make that happen or does it simply have to evolve? I think it evolves, but you know, I, I got to say, I, I, again, I grew up here and having grown up here, it, it's just been in the water, I guess. I mean, it, it is, <laughs> it is what we do. Um, and, you know, we were talking earlier um, before we started the podcast about the speed with which we were able to accomplish this. Okay. That would never happen uh, if it weren't for collaborators, probably wouldn't happen at all uh, in, in 12 or 14 years, but it probably, you know, it, uh, but it certainly wouldn't happen as quickly. And so if you want to get things done and, and you want to do things the right way, and by that, I mean the rigorous way, right? I think there is being here, I feel obligated to, to, to do things at a very high level, high quality. And I am not, I do not have the personal skill set to do that in every domain Mm -hmm. uh, as we develop this product, as we test it in different settings, mm -hmm. we have to lean on people that are thoracic surgeons. So they tell us about the esophagus. We have to lean on our cell biologists and our molecular biologists and our physiologists and our material science expert across the city up in Medford. And, and, and if you don't, you're going to do things, I think, substandardly. And so it's a, it's a matter of really, I think, living up to the notion of fulfilling the responsibility of doing something the right way. It does and sound as though there is a culture of expectations that not only will you do collaboration, but you will do outstanding and important research. So that I, for you, being a physician impel, almost compels you to, to find ways to get something done where you don't necessarily have the knowledge or the expertise, but you know you can call upon it. So it is a culture of both expectation, collaboration, and it strikes me that there's a remarkable sort of, um, I don't know for lack of a better word, there is a willingness for everybody to pitch in. And 
again, that's not something we find everywhere. So one more question on this one. Is that something in Boston's hospital, Boston Children's Hospital? I, I think so. This is a really special place. I can't tell you how lucky I feel every day to be here. I'm, I'm, I mean, it's, I'm just really I am. It is an incredibly special place. Mm-hmm. Deep, deep bench. Everywhere you look, they're just experts and really dedicated people uh, focused on patients and families. I mean, I know I sound like a commercial, but I'm. it is it is a very, very special place. And so, you know, I, Dr. I don't Strata, have much- you chat. You sound like someone who's been told you, you got to up your game. <laughs> and, and you were the one who said it to yourself, I suspect. Indeed. Well, I think that's true, but I, I, I really am. Uh, I think all of us that are here, not just me, are fortunate to be here. And it is a special place. I can't speak to the other hospitals in Boston. I know the, the people outside Boston Children's with whom sure. we've collaborated have been wonderful. Um, yes. But how the, how, the, how the cultures are at the other hospitals, you know, I'm not sure. But um, but this no, is a fair this question. Is a- <laughs> the, excuse me. The kind of research you and co- your colleagues have been involved with requires a lot of resources, uh, money, all of that. Uh, for you getting this done, what were the resources that were most critical? Yeah, yeah, that's such a great question. It is it is very resource intensive work, very expensive, and so. Um, Initially, it was because of Dr. Alan Reddick and his vision and his commitment. I started on faculty and I said, you know, Dr. Reddick, I really would like to do this. Um, Dr. Atala had left for Wake Forest in this incredible position and um, we had a void and I, I wanted to be like Dr. Atala. Uh, I still do want to be like Dr. Atala. And, uh, and I, you know, he just supported it and uh, whatever we needed, we got. And I, I did say, you know, Dr. Reddick, this will hit. We will get NIH grants. This will be successful. And uh, he said, of course. And I'm, I'm sure he's thinking to himself, yeah, right, maybe. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, but he said he believed me. And, uh, and so it was, it was almost carte blanche, you know, and uh, blank check. And uh, we were responsible stewards, though, of the resources. And, I was going uh, to say. We were and uh, careful and uh, and thoughtful about how we would spend and what we would do and strategically set up experiments like like any good lab I think, and um, so you know I think it was year seven finally, year seven, six or seven that we got our first NIH grant, um, and then from there the second and then the third and the mm-hmm. fourth and so mm-hmm. that you know once you start down that path. Um, publications start coming. That's the currency of success in academia and getting more grants. And so, um, so that, that really worked, that investment anyway, worked out, uh, but it was initially the commitment of the department, which now as the chief, I sit in, in Dr. Reddick's seat. Um, I think about it every single day and investing in junior people starting out, investing in things that are going to make impact and make a difference, selecting those and committing to those because it is a long road. If you think you're going to give someone some money and it's going to be a couple of years, you're probably mistaken. And so you have to be in it for the long haul and believe in the person. And I was fortunate that Dr. Reddick believed in me and believed in Josh and believed in us and, and, uh, and helped us succeed. So. Just a final question. Then I hope you're, I hope you've had a celebration of this because it, 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 you know, that's a 14 years is a long time, even if it's a short time by other standards, it's a, it's a long time to be engaged in something. I would, I'm curious, are you already starting to think beyond the most immediate applications? Can you look out beyond the horizon and see some applications that may seem far-fetched almost, fanciful? But can you see any of those and would you share one or two of them with us? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I, there. Gosh, we're all so hopeful. I, I think you just have to think about, you know, what causes patients, you know, the most suffering. And trachea, for example, the windpipe is mm-hmm. one of the holy grails in tissue engineering. And so it causes patients with that have issues with their trachea, very, very serious morbidity, a lot of suffering, uh, but it's very difficult to grow. So cartilage is difficult to grow, difficult. Um, <laughs> and so thinking about the benefits of silk and thinking about 
uh, its plasticity and the willingness of the body to accept it and to mold around it makes me optimistic that maybe there'll be something for trachea. Small wow. intestine. Small intestine is something that vexes, uh, particularly pediatric patients. So uh, little babies that are born very premature in the NICU um, often get something uh, mm -hmm. called necrotizing enterocolitis, NEC, NEC. And it results in short gut syndrome. And this is not something that a urologist treats, but we see these patients and families that have to deal with short gut syndrome. Uh, and short bowel syndrome and how difficult that is. And so the prospect of engineering an intestinal tissue, small intestine um, is huge. Mm -hmm. That would make great impact. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just thinking of the hollow organs, you know, things through which things traverse. Um, <laughs> but because I'm, bio, I'm, I'm sort of bilayer, uh, you know, minded, but, um, but my goodness, in tissue engineering, and certainly in urology, our holy, our true holy grail above any other holy grail is kidney tissue. And kidney so if tissue. kidney tissue, um, if you can lessen the need, even lessen the need for dialysis, let alone eliminate it or let eliminate the need for transplantation, that would be an, an unbelievable um, achievement. And so I, I hope that what's, that's in our lifetime. It's a very steep climb to say the least but uh, the kidney is incredibly complex, kind of like the pancreas, very complicated. But, but we have to be hopeful because that is, that in the pancreas is where you make, you change, change medicine. Everything. I must tell you, you're the, this will be the third conversation in which I've had this, con had this discussion about kidneys and how, you know, how far it's going to take, yeah. how long it's going to take, how, com how complex it's going to be how wrought with uh, the likelihood of failure is, it is. And yet I don't know anyone who does not see that as the Holy Grail. Yeah. I hope that those people have the same kind of enthusiasm uh, that you have for the work you're doing. And on behalf of all of us at Harris Search, I want to thank you very, very much. Congratulations. Uh, and I hope you'll continue to, to, to pursue all of these wonderful areas of, of research. Thank you so much. And once again, for the opportunity, it's been such a pleasure. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Innovators, a production of Harris Search Associates. We'll have more insightful conversations with global thought leaders to follow.